This is Harsh Rules, I'm Ben Harsh, and today we're going to learn to play The Last Hundred Yards. The Last Hundred Yards was released in 2019 by GMT Games and designed by Mike Denson. This game supports up to two players and takes from one to three hours to play. Before we begin this episode, I'd like to recognize the Harsh Rules Patreon supporters that help make content like this possible. If you'd like to support the channel, head over to patreon.com slash harsh rules to learn more. And once again, thank you for your support. Harsh Rules is partnering with Nightingale Games to support War Room, the second edition on Kickstarter. If you missed the main campaign in June, don't worry, there's still an opportunity to order at a discounted price. And if you already own the first edition, you don't need to buy the entire game again. Post-launch, enhanced components like the redesigned morale board, the nano expansion, and other game upgrades will be available at the Nightingale Games web store. So don't miss out on War Room 2nd Edition, and keep your eyes on this channel for a rules breakdown on the new quick battle system and other enhancements. Welcome back to the Harsh Rules Breakdown for the last 100 yards. In the previous episode, we reviewed the initiative phase and covered an overview of the activation phase, where we learned how players conduct actions in activation and reaction segments. In this episode, we're going to learn more about the actions needed to play the game's first mission. Therefore, we will only cover rules regarding infantry squads, platoon leaders, and machine gun sections. Vehicle rules will be discussed in a future episode. There are also some non-vehicular rules not used in the first mission that we will cover later as well. For example, as noted in the mission briefing, a 90-minute barrage has knocked out communications for supporting mortar and artillery batteries. Therefore, mortar rules will be covered in a later episode. Actions that are used in the first mission include maneuvers for basic movement and assaults, recovery actions, and small arms fire actions. With a focus on those rules, let's walk through the remaining phases to understand the overall procedures for a game turn. Many of these actions set up combat instances that are resolved in later phases. Units on the game map are tagged with die roll modifier markers for specific combat types to coordinate their resolution. For example, units tagged with green small arms fire, gold anti-tank fire, and red mortar fire die roll modifier markers are resolved in the fire resolution phase. Next, the outcome of opposing units inhabiting the same hex in close quarters combat are decided in the assault resolution phase. The final three phases close out the game turn. Mortar fire markers, mortar recovery, forward observer status, and fire extensions are handled in the mortar fire adjustment phase. Game time spent in the turn is recorded in the determine time lapse phase. And finally, markers are adjusted, squad configuration and leader replacements are managed, and victory conditions are checked in the cleanup phase. Now, with a basic understanding of the procedures of a game turn, let's look at actions that players can conduct with their units in the game's first mission. Welcome back to the Harsh Rules Breakdown for the last 100 yards. This episode is dedicated to the actions that players will need to learn to play the game's first mission. Therefore, we're going to walk through maneuver actions, recover actions, and fire actions. As we saw in the last episode, whenever a unit takes an action, it is tagged with an action marker to track that that unit is spent. Maneuver and recover actions use one type of marker, and fire actions are tracked with a separate marker. Each side's counters are marked with their emblem and a specific color to differentiate them from each other. When using these markers, keep in mind that they reflect the units conducting actions and are the only units that an enemy player may react to. To begin, let's take a look at maneuver actions. There are several types of maneuvers, 
In this episode, we will focus on those applicable to non-vehicular units, in other words, infantry type units. These are maneuvers that you'll want to use in the game's first mission. The most common is generically called a maneuver, which essentially means moving a unit from hex to hex. Other maneuver types include assaults, which are maneuvers that position opposing units in the same hex to conduct close quarters combat. Related to assaults are feints, which also allow non-vehicular units to call off an assault at the last minute. Withdrawals allow non-vehicular units to disengage from the enemy by moving one to four hexes towards their friendly board edge. And finally, deploy maneuvers allow a squad to split into two sections or two section units to recombine again into a squad. First though, let's look at the prime maneuver action centered around unit movement. Before we get into the mechanics of movement, let's first talk about a hex's stacking limit. A player may stack a maximum of three squads, two machine gun sections, two vehicles, one towed gun, one fortified position, and two non-vehicular, non-combat units, each. Examples of these are platoon leaders and LATW units, or light anti-tank weapon units. All of these can be stacked in a single hex. Now let's talk about some rules and exceptions. Riders slash passengers do count towards the stacking limit, and two sections of infantry are equivalent to one squad for stacking purposes. The stacking limit is checked at the end of each platoon activation cycle. The owning player eliminates any excess units. Moving non-vehicular type units on the game maps follows two sets of rules. There is a minimum movement rule and a pay to enter style of movement. The movement allowance for these types are dependent on whether that unit is conducting a maneuver during an activation or a reaction. For non-vehicular movements, following the minimum movement rule for a unit in activation, it may move up to two hexes. If the unit is conducting a maneuver in reaction, it may only move one hex. For greater range, a player may wish to use the pay to enter style of movement. Following these movement rules, a unit pays movement points to enter a hex. The cost to enter a hex is based on its terrain type. Terrain costs can be found on the terrain effects table of the combat table's foldout reference card. Now, each type of unit may have its own distinct allowance of movement points. A unit's movement point allowance is determined by whether it is conducting a maneuver action in activation or as a reaction. For activation, non-vehicular units are allowed three movement points. Armored fighting vehicles, five movement points, half tracks, five movement points, and trucks, six movement points. However, when in reaction, Non-vehicular units are allowed two movement points and vehicles four movement points. When conducting movement type maneuvers though, there are some rules to be aware of. First, a unit may not enter a hex unless it has the necessary movement points. To enter a hex, the player must pay the full movement cost required. Second, a non-vehicular unit must end its maneuver when it enters an enemy-occupied hex. And third, towed guns cannot maneuver unless transported by a carrier unit, which makes sense because they are in fact towed. Now that you understand the basic concepts behind movement-based maneuvers, let's look at some other maneuver types. Next, let's talk about assaults. Assaults allow units to move into an opponent's hex and conduct close quarters combat. For infantry, a unit must be at least two hexes from their target to conduct an assault. Within this range, there are two types of assaults. An adjacent assault occurs when a unit is one hex from a target, and what I call a charging assault can be conducted from two hexes away. To understand the rationale for these two types, it's important to visualize the distance to the target. 
Each hex is approximately 50 yards in length. Therefore, two hexes end-to-end -end would be the length of an entire American football field. Therefore, an adjacent assaulting force is close enough to quickly close in and engage the enemy while a charging assault, because of its distance, gives the opponent time to fire at them. From a rules perspective, both assaults follow the same mechanics. The difference is that the charging assault is delayed to allow reaction fire. Let's first look at the adjacent assault to get the general idea. First, the player declares which units will conduct the assault and the targeted hex. Since the assaulting unit is adjacent, the counter is moved into the target hex and tagged with an assault marker bearing the nation's flag. The assault is then ready to be resolved in the assault resolution phase. Now let's look at how a charging assault works. Just like before, the assaulting player declares the assaulting units in the targeted hex. However, since the assaulting unit is two hexes away, they are moved into the adjacent hex and tagged with an assault arrow marker. The unit then temporarily ends their maneuver, which allows the enemy player to react to their assault. Then, during the marker adjustment step of the current platoon activation cycle, the assault arrow marker is removed, and the assaulting units are moved into the assault hex. The unit is then tagged with an assault nationality marker, just like with an adjacent assault. Alternatively, the assaulting units may instead declare a feint and cancel the assault, in which case they are not placed in the hex. Now that we've learned how to set up an assault, it will be resolved in the fourth game phase for assault resolution, which we will cover in a subsequent episode. Next, let's talk about the withdraw maneuver. Withdrawal is a maneuver action allowing non-vehicular units to conduct an orderly disengagement from the enemy. Units may withdraw as part of a platoon's activation or in reaction. Units do not expend maneuver points to withdraw, but instead can withdraw from one to four hexes towards their friendly board edge. Also, some or all units in a hex may withdraw individually or as a stack. While we're discussing withdraw, we will also cover the rules for retreat, since they're nearly identical. A, a retreat is one of the many outcomes of an assault. When retreating, a player can move two to four hexes towards their friendly board edge. Between these two rule sets, there is one exception for retreats, which allows them to enter an enemy-occupied hex. Now, let's cover some rule exceptions. When withdrawing, a unit cannot enter an enemy-occupied hex or a primary impact hex from a mortar, but can enter a secondary impact hex. This is where there is an exception with retreat, where retreating units can enter an enemy-occupied hex if there is no other option. However, continuing with our list of exceptions, they may exit any primary or secondary impact hex but will suffer the mortar fire attack upon exiting. We'll learn more about this in a later episode when I cover mortars. Units cannot withdraw from an assault hex but may attempt to withdraw when under assault. And finally, withdrawals during night in or through one or more river, marsh, jungle, or urban building hexes are limited to three hexes. With those exceptions in mind, let's look at the actual game mechanics for moving units to conduct a withdrawal or a retreat. Conducting a withdrawal or retreat can be tricky based on the position of the friendly board edge relative to a hex's sides. In some missions, hex sides can be parallel to friendly board edges. In other missions, hexes are not parallel to the friendly board edge. In other words, a hex's pointed side is towards the board edge. First, let's look at mission setups where hex sides are parallel to friendly board edges, like in Mission 1. Finding a withdraw or retreat path follows a priority system meant to simulate the safest route. Let's walk through them. The primary rule is that a unit must always move into hexes towards the friendly board edge. Following that primary rule, First, the unit must move into a hex not adjacent to an enemy combat unit. 
Second, if this route is not possible, then the unit can move adjacent to an enemy combat unit. Third, if the unit is adjacent to the friendly board edge or impassable terrain, then the unit may withdraw along it as long as each hex is further away from the original hex. And fourth, when withdrawing along an impassable river, the unit must attempt to cross at a ford or bridge if possible. Units that can't meet these criteria are eliminated. For conducting a retreat, there's actually a fifth priority, and that's if there's no other maneuver than to move into an enemy hex. This will trigger a new assault, with the retreating unit becoming the attacker. Now, I'm showing an example from the playbook to illustrate the paths generated by following this process. In this example, the German unit is attempting a 4-hex withdrawal. Following the process, this unit must move towards the German-friendly board edge at the southern end of this map. Following the priority process, the only available hex they can move into is H3 because this hex has precedent over the hex directly below them. That hex is adjacent to an enemy U.S. squad. With the second move, there is no hex that is not adjacent to an enemy unit. So the German squad has two options. They can move into G4 or H4. The path continues for the third and fourth movements, following the same process. As you can see, there are several pathways to follow. Boiling these priorities down, you really have two options. Looking for hexes that are not adjacent to an enemy unit, or, if those are not available, moving into hexes adjacent to enemy units. The other priorities don't come into play unless you run into impassable terrain like a river or the friendly board edge itself. Finally, if at any time during withdrawal or retreat, if an undisrupted non-vehicular unit moves adjacent to an enemy-occupied hex containing an undisrupted or non-shocked enemy combat unit, the withdrawing unit is tagged with a regrouping marker. If the unit is retreating, it conducts a cohesion check. Unless the withdrawing unit was disrupted, the enemy occupied hex is a primary impact hex or contains an assault arrow or a nationality marker. Or the hex entered contains an undisrupted friendly combat unit. So what does a regrouping marker mean? In the last hundred yards, regrouping represents the usual and expected temporary vulnerability and disorder of units immediately after an assault or a withdrawal. Units with a regrouping marker are limited to one of the following actions. They can conduct a small arms fire action, reduced by one against an adjacent hex, a recovery attempt, or they can withdraw. Regrouping markers are removed immediately when a unit recovers, disrupts, or withdraws. When hex sides are not parallel to a friendly board edge, the priority sequence is similar except that now lateral movement is an option. If you look at this example, once again borrowed from the playbook, the German unit's first movement can now be made into a lateral hex. However, players cannot conduct an entire retreat or withdrawal through lateral movement. Consecutive lateral movements are prohibited. The second movement must then be made next to an enemy combat unit. There are two paths for this. So basically, the priority is pretty much the same, by moving into a hex towards the friendly board edge that is not adjacent to an enemy combat unit. If this is not available, check for lateral movement. If there is no lateral movement options, or you just move laterally, then the unit may move adjacent to an enemy combat unit. Once again, there is also an exception for retreating units that when no other options are present, they can move into an enemy-occupied hex and trigger an assault. Next, let's take a look at the deployment maneuver. Deploy is a special maneuver action allowing a player to split an infantry squad into two sections at any time during the platoon activation or reaction segment. Each deployed section may maneuver, fire, or conduct no action at all. There is no movement point cost to deploy. To conduct a deployment maneuver, remove the deploying squad counter from play and replace it with two randomly selected section counters not currently in play from the same platoon. 
To recombine sections into a squad, anytime two sections of the same platoon are in the same hex during step three of cleanup phase, two sections may recombine into a squad, selected at random from the same platoon. If one of the two sections is disrupted, a recovery die roll is made and compared to the cohesion of the non-disrupted section. If the die result is less than or equal to that section's cohesion rating, the two sections are then replaced with a non-disrupted squad. Otherwise, they are replaced with a disrupted squad. A quick note, concealment is only retained if both sections were concealed prior to the recombination. Be aware though, there are some restrictions to this deploy maneuver. First, disrupted units may not deploy. Second, deployment is limited to one squad per infantry platoon. Also, only one of the two sections are allowed to conduct a fire action at the moment of deployment. And finally, sections that do not conduct an action at the time of deployment are limited to reactions for the balance of the game turn. In the last hundred yards, there are three types of fire actions. Small arms fire, anti-tank fire, and mortar fire. Small arms fire is used against and only affects non-vehicular units. In other words, flesh and blood targets. Anti-tank fire is used against and only affects vehicles, towed guns, and fortified positions. In other words, hard targets. Mortar fire affects both vehicular and non-vehicular units. Each firing unit is limited to a single fire action, either a small arms or an anti-tank fire attack. There is one exception to this rule. Fortified positions with anti-tank weapons may fire their anti-tank gun and machine gun either together or separately once per game turn. All small arms and anti-tank fire must be within range and line of sight of the target at the time of fire. After line of sight is confirmed to a target, a small arms fire action can be set up. Then the player will need to calculate the die roll modifier to tag the targeted unit with. Later in the fire resolution phase, all DRM mark units will be resolved with die rolls. Before we jump ahead to calculating modifiers though, let's first learn how the underlying cohesion mechanic works. Small arms fire can only be used against an opponent that has a green cohesion stat in its lower right hand corner. The cohesion number tells players how much fire a unit can take before it is reduced. Combat die rolls in the last 100 yards are made with a 10 sided die. Therefore, the German infantry unit's cohesion provides protection from die results 1 through 5. However, that unit is vulnerable to die results above this. A die result of 6 through 9 will disrupt a full strength unit. If that unit is already disrupted, it would then inflict a casualty. And a die result of 10 or greater will inflict a casualty on an undisrupted unit. This may reduce a squad to a section or eliminate a section entirely. Now that we understand how small arms fire works without modifiers, let's bring some modifiers into play. Modifiers exist to account for combat situations such as range, cover, visibility, etc. A key rule to remember with modifiers is regardless of how many are in effect, the maximum modifier that can be applied as a penalty is negative 4. The first modifier to factor into small arms fire is range. When referencing the small arms DRM table, you'll notice a numbered row at the top. This is the range of the firing unit. You'll map the firing unit's small arms fire range number here. Once you find the appropriate column, the numbers beneath refer to the distance in hexes to the target. Once you've found this result, trace this back to the column on the far left, which lists the actual die roll modifier, which we call DRM. Now, you'll also notice that this table continues down with combat situations and their equivalent DRMs. So for our example, we have a US squad with a range of 8. The targeted German squad is 5 hexes away. 
This means a negative three die roll modifier. However, the US squad has a plus one small arms value as its stat. Therefore, the overall die roll modifier for this attack is negative two. So a green negative two DRM marker is placed on the German unit. Players will run this calculation for every small arms fire action, and then all of the markers will be resolved with die rolls in the fire resolution phase. A recovery action allows disrupted, regrouping, and shock units, which are applicable to armored fighting vehicles, the opportunity to recover in a platoon activation or reaction segment. Some recovery attempts are mandatory. Passengers may not attempt recovery unless their transporting unit is stationary. And no unit can attempt recovery if in a primary impact or assault hex. Recovery actions are resolved with a 10-sided die roll. Die results within an infantry unit's cohesion rating will allow the unit to recover. Die results that exceed the unit's cohesion rating will leave it disrupted. Die results can be modified by a plus one if the unit is suppressed, or a negative one if the recovery is assisted by a platoon leader. There are also two unique die result outcomes to be aware of. With a die result of one or less, the unit will rally, which not only recovers the unit, bringing it back to its non-disrupted side, but allows the unit to immediately conduct an action. When an unmodified die result of 10 is rolled, then if the unit attempting recovery is within five hexes of an enemy unit, they will recover and be marked heroic. Otherwise, the unit remains disrupted or regrouping. In the last hundred yards, heroism characterizes an infantry combat unit temporarily exhibiting extremely brave, but possibly reckless, behavior in the heat of battle. Recovery actions are resolved with a 10-sided die roll. Die results within an infantry unit's cohesion rating will allow the unit to recover. Die results that exceed the unit's cohesion rating will leave it disrupted. Die results can be modified by a plus one if the unit is suppressed, or a negative one if the recovery is assisted by a platoon leader. There are also two unique die result outcomes to be aware of. With a die result of one or less, the unit will rally, which not only recovers the unit, bringing it back to its non-disrupted side, but allows the unit to immediately conduct an action. Or they may wait and react later in the game turn. When an unmodified die result of 10 is rolled, then if the unit attempting recovery is within five hexes of an enemy unit, they will recover and be marked heroic. Otherwise, the unit remains disrupted or regrouping. In the last hundred yards, heroism characterizes an infantry combat unit temporarily exhibiting extremely brave, but possibly reckless, behavior in the heat of battle. When a unit goes heroic, it automatically recovers, is marked with a heroic marker, and must immediately conduct a maneuver action. Heroic units instantly have a cohesion of eight and a maneuver allowance of three hexes. They are immune to disruption, but suffer a casualty instead while continuing to maintain their heroic status, unless eliminated. The heroic unit must select as its target hex the closest enemy occupied hex within five hexes, excluding hexes marked with a mortar DRM marker, hexes prohibited entry by mission special rules, or hexes that if entered would result in overstacking. If there is no valid target hex, the unit is not heroic and remains disrupted. A unit is no longer heroic and the marker is removed if, when the target hex is vacant of enemy units, either at the beginning of the heroic unit's action or at the time of entry of the target hex, or when under an assault and the assaulting units faint, or after the assault resolution die roll but prior to any cohesion checks. And now that we've reviewed the recovery action, this is a good place to break for this episode.
In this episode, we learned how to set up combat, and in the next episode, we will resolve those combat instances as we work our way through the fire resolution and the assault resolution game turn phases. So make sure you're subscribed to the channel so you'll know when the next episode in this series becomes available. If you found this video helpful, please give me a like and share with your friends. To be the first notified when the next episode of Harsh Rules becomes available, please hit the bell icon for notifications. And as always, this is Ben Harsh for Harsh Rules. Thank you so much for watching, and I'll see you on the next video.